Okay, we're going to get underway. Uh, I'd like to welcome uh, everyone that's joined on the uh, Zoom call this morning. I'm Norwin Marins of the FJMC Midwest Region. And our okay. guest uh, celebrity speaker this morning is Jeff Agrist, who is the deputy sports editor and media writer for the Chicago Sun-Times. He's been with the Sun-Times for more than 18 years and has covered sports uh, in the Chicago area during that period of time. Uh, previous to that, I believe he worked for Pro Football Weekly. Is that right, Jeff? Correct. And he's a graduate of the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign Journalism School. Uh, Jeff is a friend and fellow colleague of mine at Temple Beth Israel in Skokie. Huh. Uh, hopefully we will have others join us. He's also the great nephew of our revered Jerry Agrist, who's on the call. And uh, Jerry's a past international president of the FJMC. Huh. So uh, without uh, further ado, I'd like to uh, present uh, Jeff. This is going to be a rather uh, open, spontaneous program. There's certainly enough sports uh, content to talk about for more than one hour, let alone one. But we'll get started. And if you have questions, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, place those within the uh, context of Jeff's uh, comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Norwin. It's good to see everybody. Hope everybody's staying well and hanging in there as best as possible during this pandemic and everything that has come along with it. Um, like Norwin said, I'm the deputy sports editor at the Chicago Sun Times. I um, my primary responsibility is I run the copy desk, so I work nights. And when the stories come in, I'm in charge of assigning them to our copy editors. And I'm the last line of defense on uh, the pages before they get sent to the printer uh, for publication. So I read all the stories. I look at all the headlines and captions. I help come up with headlines and help come up with uh, the back page. Uh, we're a tabloid like the New York papers. So I try to base our back pages off of a lot of things that they've done over the years. I'm a big fan of those New York tabloids and since sometimes been a tabloid forever, I try to sort of um, copy their lead and uh, have a lot of fun with it. Um, our back page today, I should have brought it with me here was uh, uh, watch and learn was the headline with Matt Nagy, the bears coach watch the Bucks Packers game on television set because he's not going to be in the game. And we thought it'd be a good chance for him to learn from winning teams. So we had a picture of him uh, looking at a big screen television on a wall of uh, Aaron Rodgers getting tackled by the Buccaneers. And you, know, you can have some fun with that um, when you're a tabloid. And um, I do have a beat uh, now the last three years I've covered sports media. So if anybody wanted to, um, to have any discussions about the announcers they watch or the production of the games they watch. I'm certainly game for that. My, my, one of my favorite um, topics of conversation is sports coverage and how they're presented on television and radio and now with streaming services and online and websites and those types of things, uh, how they cover sports. I'm all in for a discussion on uh, those types of things in regarding to sports media. But I know we've had a heck of a week in um, in sports and we have a heck of a day coming up with the championship games. Um, I know recently we've lost Don Sutton, Hall of Famer. We've lost Hank Aaron, Hall of Famer. And um, we've lost a lot of top notch athletes in the last year, uh, like you do every year, but this past year seems to have been the most uh, difficult to go through maybe because of the pandemic exacerbating things. But, um, you know, Hank Aaron, I'm not a contemporary of his, but I've, I've seen the home run and I've heard every call of the home run and I know the story. And I think what stands out to me most about Hank Aaron isn't just the hitting, because he hit from the time he began to the time he finished, um, but what he had to deal with. You know, we're so, as baseball fans, we're so familiar with what Jackie Robinson had to go through to, to break the color barrier, but you know, it, it didn't take, it, it took a while for me to understand that Hank Aaron went through as much, if not worse, because of the pursuit of the home run record and where he was playing in the South after the Braves had moved from Milwaukee to Atlanta. And I just can't imagine having to deal with not only the pressure of breaking a record, you know, we talk, 
you think back to when McGuire and Sosa were breaking that record and the media attention that they had, obviously it was 1998, a different time, but uh, Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's record, uh, career record of home runs in Atlanta. And uh, I've heard Vin Sully's call of how, you know, a black man was getting cheered in the deep South for breaking uh, an all time great baseball players record. And, and the joy that people seem to have in sharing that unbelievable accomplishment, but yet there were plenty more who didn't want him to have anything to do with it. And the way that he handled those things with grace and patience um, was, was beyond anything that, you know, I'm sure most of us could have possibly handled. Um, anybody have remembrances of Hank? Anybody seen Hank play in person, whether it was in, you know, at, at Wrigley? Um, or, or in, in, in Milwaukee, even uh, any any remembrances of, of Hank Aaron out there? Yep. I, w I was at a game in Atlanta at Atlanta Fulton County Stadium. Uh, sure. It was, uh, it was uh, in August of 1969. The Cubs were um, about eight and a half games uh, ahead of the New York Mets. The Mets were playing the Braves uh, for a weekend series, and. Uh, it was quite a lineup at that time. They had uh, Hank Aaron and uh, uh, Rico Cardi and I believe Orlando Cepeda uh, and a few other sluggers that were part of that lineup. Um, and he was out in, I believe, right field. So I, I do have a recollection of, of that particular game. Hard to believe it's that many years ago. I know, that happens. Um, what, what I found amusing in watching uh, the uh, the record-breaking home run, if you go to when, when they're celebrating with him beyond behind home plate toward the dugout, you talk about different times now. Uh, I don't know if you remember, there used to be an Indian in a, in a teepee beyond the outfield wall in Atlanta. Yeah. And um, here comes the Indian to pat Hank Aaron on the head or the, the, the back, I'm sorry. Uh, to celebrate the record and I mean you just <laughs> you couldn't have that anymore that just wouldn't be uh, uh, nobody would be in favor of having that sort of depiction of the Indian and, and just the fact that he would come out and celebrate from his teepee I mean this is a tangent I know but uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I thought like is, was that the Indian mascot celebrating with Hank Aaron at home plate and it was so that was um, that was humorous a different time obviously um, but Don Sutton too you know I I, I, I'm more a contemporary of Don Sutton's career, the end or toward the end of his career. I'm I'm 46, um, but also his impact in broadcasting, an excellent broadcaster, you know, on the Atlanta Braves yeah. games and nationally too. Just a, a, a revered individual, uh, beloved by by many, and, and also taken too soon. You know, hey, I, I don't think anybody knew he was sick, at least publicly, and um, and Don Sutton too, very. You know, this past year in 2020, I remember seeing on, on social media, somebody put together a Hall of Fame lineup, a complete nine or even 10 man lineup of, of Hall of Famers who had passed away in, in, in 2002. Um, you know, Whitey Ford was in that group also. I'm, I'm trying to go through it in my head. Um, Joe Morgan, just, um, just quite something that uh, baseball took a real took a real hit this past year with, with the Hall of Famers that we've lost. But they were incredible players. And now I know we have the Hall of Fame ballot. We're gonna have the announcement of the Hall of Fame class on Tuesday and for this coming year, for 2021. And there's been a lot of talk about uh, the people who are nearing the end of their run on the ballot. Barry Bonds, Roger Clemens, they've been getting more votes these last few years. But now Kurt Schilling, who came out seemingly in favor of the Capitol riots a couple weeks ago, um, his candidacy is really in jeopardy because people are saying that they'd like to have. So when his, he had sent out a, a social media post supporting the Capitol riots, it sounded like, and a lot of voters who had already sent their ballots were hoping to get them or have him removed after seeing that. Um, I think everybody knew that Kurt leaned toward the right, if not further. <laughs> so, you know, I figure if you voted for him, you probably had a sense of what he was about in the first place. But after he tweeted out 
uh, his sentiments about that Capitol riot, people wanted to have their votes changed. Um, as far as the Hall of Fame, you know, I can get, I can get the class up here on my, on my computer here. Are there any thoughts to sort of the modern day ground rules of candidacy for, or induction into the Hall of Fame? You know, do, does anybody think that Bonds and Clemens belong in there? A lot of people do, and that's, that's completely fine. Um, you could make strong arguments for, for either side, but um, in, in the PED age, does that present a problem to you as having those types of Hall of Famers? You know, there have been plenty of Hall of Famers who've done some lousy things. Um, I'd say more I'd, out in the open. I'd say to ask Mike Piazza if he thinks Clemens belongs in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, understandable. I um, I'd like to know that myself. I know they had that run in in the 2000 World Series. Uh, and, and even before then, when uh, Clemens went headhunting on Piazza uh, in the regular season games. Right. Um, so, yeah, they, they certainly have a history. But and you know the guys in here? I was going to say, headhunting is legitimate, but to pick up the ball and then th or the bat piece and throw bat it at him. He was yeah. on something, boy. He was. Uh, I don't know what he was uh, taking. It, it was, could have been Roy, Roy Rage as opposed to Road Rage. <laughs> right. He thought he, I remember him saying he thought it was the ball. Right. Uh, I don't. I don't know how you make that. I don't know how you can't make that distinction. Um, <laughs> ridiculous. But if yeah. So get, on Tuesday night. Yes. If we get back to uh, Hank Aaron just for a moment. Um, of course. I never got to see him play at Wrigley. I did see Clemente play at Wrigley. Um, oh wow. That, that, that guy he had an arm. I mean, he threw someone out from deep right field on a rope. He didn't even bother with a relay man. It went straight to the catcher. But um, getting back to Hank Aaron, there was a really good article in your competitor's newspaper. Uh, Paul Sullivan, who's sort of a dean of the, yeah. the sports writers, had an article. Absolutely. And it sort of talked to what Aaron was going through, that when he was approaching the record, he had to have two hotel rooms, one under his name and one under a fictitious name where he would stay for protection. Uh, plus, he had police bodyguards with him wherever he went, and even his children had police security when they went to school. So it was really getting crazy and out of hand with the uh, with the death threats and the the vile letters to him. Um, yeah, it was a different time, but still, it's uh, you read these things, and you know, and and Billy Williams from the Cubs, who was a, a good friend of of Hank Aaron. Uh, they'd get together in the off season and Aaron would share some of these letters with Billy Williams. Uh, yeah, he kept them. He kept the letters. He, uh, it's like he wanted proof. He wanted to show people, you know, you, you have this evidence of, of what you, what you've dealt with. And he used it almost, I, I don't know, did he, did he use it as motivation? Did he just not want to, I, I can't, I can't even imagine the feelings that would go through someone having to, after reading the awful, brilliant things that, that he read, just, just terrific. And yeah, um, he would perform consistently year after year. Yeah, yeah. So yeah Jeff, I'm, I'm not much of a baseball aficionado, but a couple of months ago, I was in Las Vegas with my son who was running the marathon, and we see Johnny Bench signing autographs. Uh, oh. in, a, in, a, in a, He looked like a prostitute in Amsterdam, you know, where he's in this little room. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's signing autographs by appointment. And you're talking about who's admitted into the Hall of Fame and who's not. And I was curious to know what you think about Johnny Bench. One of the greatest pitchers of all time, you know? I mean, uh, I think, though, I, I know the, the look, the appearance of the Hall of Famer signing autographs might not be appealing, you know, uh, they're getting paid for it, but they can put HOF on their signature and it's worth something to the people who seek out these autographs. So I don't know if that's, you know, the, the, the depiction of, it's a funny analogy you made, but, you know, I, I think Johnny, he's a stand-up guy, it seems, you know, he's, he's still in commercials. Uh, if you watch MLB Network, he's still on television. So he's some, you know, he's not, He's not Pete Rose, um, who is very much of what the, the analogy you made there. But um, you know what? I, I, misspoke. Great... Wait, wait. I misspoke and I apologize to Johnny Bench. It was Pete Rose. 
Oh, you uh, meant Pete Rose. Okay. Oh, I, that's I, I told you I'm not an aficionado. <laughs> yeah. So I, my apologies. And thank you for saying that. It was sure. Pete Rose, who's banned from the Wall of Fame, right? Banned from the Hall of Fame, yes. Banned from baseball. Yeah. That's the question. Um, I apologize to you, not Johnny. Oh, no, no. Pete Rose. I only Understand know him. about 10 players, so those are two of the 10 that I know. So, okay. I, I think Pete Rose belongs in the Hall of Fame. Okay. I do. I I, he's the, he is the all-time hit leader. And I think by now he's paid his penance and he belongs in the Hall of Fame. You think I he think, will be? I do not. I, I think he is going to, I, I, I don't know when, if ever, but I think it, it almost seems like it's being passed down from one commissioner to the next. Um, and I don't see any, any, any future commissioner, even if it's Theo Epstein going against previous commissioners and overturning that. Mm -hmm. Which is tough to say when you're going to have when you might have Barry Bonds or Roger Clemens in the Hall of Fame right. uh, for for openly, you know, cheating within the game, and you have Pete Rose who obviously did a broke the rules, no doubt about it, but um, it's it's enough to me. It's enough. He's he's done his time. If we're gonna. Yeah equated to uh, you know a prison sentence he's had it he's been hurt and um, I, I've read the book um, Lords of the Realm by John Helliar it's the uh, the real quote unquote real history of baseball it's all about the owners of baseball the lords of the realm from the beginning of, of time pretty much and it goes through the Rose episode and how it just about killed uh, Bart Giamatti, the right. commissioner at the time, and all the, the 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 travesty that it was, and just how it hurt the game. That was a long time ago now, and I think um, I think Pete, still one of the best players of all time, and uh, I think he belongs in there. Um, oh, of course, of course. Baseball starting in like three weeks. We get uh, pitchers and catchers reporting to uh, Arizona and Florida. We hope because of uh, whatever awaits us in the next month with this pandemic. Um, but also today we have the AFC and NFC championship games, which is a huge deal. Uh, we have the chance of having a repeat of Super Bowl one if things go right with the Packers and Chiefs. And that'd be fun to watch. We almost had that last year too. The Niners prevented that from happening, but that'd be fun to see. And we have perhaps the best group of four quarterbacks on a championship Sunday we've ever had. Uh, I have to do some research, but when you have Aaron Rodgers and Tom Brady and Patrick Mahomes as three of the four, uh, those appear to be three future Hall of Famers. I'm not ready to put Josh Allen in that group yet, but he's had a heck of a season and he is a lot of fun to watch with his mobility and, and his arm and what those bills, that's one of the best offenses in football with, uh, Stephon Diggs and Josh Allen connecting. So I think we're going to have two really good games today. Um, Rodgers and Brady, that's going to be fantastic. We met, they met before and it didn't go so well for Rodgers. But I think in the environment of an NFC title game, it's going to be very special. And in Green Bay, where the weather's not going to be so great. Um, Brady has, you know, you have teams that come into Green Bay from warmer climates. Brady played, what, 20 years in New England. So he's not going to have any problem dealing with that weather there. And um, so I think that bodes well for the Buccaneers. Remember back in the day, it was the Buccaneers when they were in the NFC Central with the Packers. They had a long run of losing in games under a certain temperature, like below 50 degrees. They had never won in their franchise history. They come into Soldier Field one day in December uh, and beat the Bears. And that was the first time that they had won in that kind of climate. But I don't see them being... Um, a problem at all for, for Brady. They have a running game with, uh, with, with Ronald Jones, so they can keep the ball on the ground if they need to. And the defense has been very good, and they gave Rodgers a huge problem in that first meeting. I think it's going to be a very tight game there. And then the Bills and the Chiefs, very entertaining game, two high-powered offenses. There could be a lot of points scored in that game, but uh, they both could be close. The, the line is basically three points for the home team in both, which is basically a push because Vegas will give three points to the home team generally. No matter <coughs> um, 
I think it's gonna be really tight. I like I like the Packers and Chiefs. I hope that happens. Does anybody have any strong thoughts of how these games are gonna to go today? Which team has the most Jewish players? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough one. I uh, I have to look that up, and that would take a long time probably. I don't uh, I don't Mar- know Mar- of many. Lee- Mar- Marv Levy's still with us, isn't he? Marv Levy is still with us. We used to live um, in Lincoln Park, not far from where he lived, off of Diversity in Sheridan. And I would see him around the neighborhood from time to time, walking around. Um, very special man. And uh, I hope he's he'll be watching today because uh, the Bills are. That's a great story. That's a long time coming. When you think back to the force, I mean, to think of a an accomplishment of that happening again, four straight appearances in the Super Bowl. Yeah, they didn't win any of them, but my goodness, that that was amazing to see. It was the it was the Bills and the Cowboys it seemed every year. Uh, but I remember after the Bills had lost those four, fans turning on the team and burning jerseys in their fireplaces. That city would, I think, you know, kill for another run of, of four in a row after having not been to the playoffs for as long as they were. Uh, so it's all a matter of perspective. They was that was their heyday. Um, but what's also fun about Bills Chiefs is it's an old AFL game, right? So you know, I love the history of these things. You could have a Bill or a Packers Chiefs Super Bowl one repeat, but you've got a Bills Chiefs AFL championship game from I think '66 or '67. So that's special to have these um, you know old time matchups in a in a new time landscape. Um, any anybody fan of the AFL back in the back in the day? Uh, you know when when you had Joe Namath putting that league uh, giving that league validity uh, when they beat the Colts um, before the merger. Um, any AFL fans? <laughs> I think this yeah. Is the- yeah. There we go. Yeah. I lived in Waukegan. I lived in Waukegan at the time of the Great Ice Bowl. Dallas versus oh, Green Bay. And a sure. guy I worked with went to the game and I saw him the next morning. And I said, what was it like being at the game? His answer was, I don't know. I spent the whole time, whole time trying to keep warm. Yeah. And that was I'll his bet. experience. <laughs> I'll bet that looked cold. You know, it was that, awful. Looked, that looked awful. You know, uh, I, I, I sat in cold football games. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Can you talk just uh, well, real quick? Can you talk about since I'm from New York? So of yeah. course we have the rivalry between the Mets and the Yankees. But you and Chicago now have the Cubs versus the White Sox, and Cubs teams I guess get all the uh, the press. But now that Chicago making all these trades, is it a big rivalry between you know the North Side versus the South Side? You know, I mean I I went to uh, uh, Wrigley Field like in I guess '96 or so. Phenomenal. It was the best experience yeah. I ever had with Harry Carey singing. It's so family oriented, but can you speak about Chicago? You know, is a, you know, like we, I, I'm a, I'm a baseball fan, but in New York, you either hate, if you like the Mets, you hate the Yankees. If you like the Yankees, hate the Mets. I'm not like that. I like both teams. So Ooh. how is it in Chicago? It's similar. It's very similar. There are some who, who like both. Um, I am, I, I lean heavily toward the Cubs. I always have. Uh, my my wife is is a South Sider, so her side leans toward the Sox, and we have a lot of fun with that. Uh, the rivalry was really strong when interleague first began, and it got it got hot uh, in the late '90s and uh, early 2000s. Maybe you'll remember the the Michael Baird AJ Pierzynski brawl, which was right. Just, just fantastic. Um, but there was genuine bad blood between the teams because you had personalities. You had Carlos Zambrano on the Cubs, AJ Pierzynski on the White Sox. There was talking back and forth. The fans were super into it. There was even a time where Jerry Manuel, then the White Sox manager, set up his rotation for the Cubs series, which was unheard of to set up your regular season rotation for an interleague series in June. You know, you do that for a September series and you're going buying for a playoff spot, not for a mid-season series against an interleague team. But it was um, it was a big deal. And it, it's not as big a deal anymore 
because it's been so long now and usually one team has been good and one team has been bad. But now that the Sox are competitive and the Cubs are competitive, I think this past year would have been really special had there been fans in the ballpark. And that's what it comes down to. Yeah, right. No, ba- back then you had players openly not liking each other, but that that has passed, unfortunately. Uh, and now it's mostly a fan a fan experience. And it is a great crowd. It's a fantastic, they get full houses every game. But I think this past year would have been, that, that last series of the year would have been really special um, so. for Cubs Sox if it had been, you know, if they were both battling for a playoff spot and um, in seeding. And that would have been, that would, that's what amps up the series is the fans. Um, and it's, they're, they're fun games to go to, but they haven't been as fun because it's kind of old hat now, you know, and it's uh, Michael, you have any thoughts on, on Cub Sox? Yeah, I've been to a number of Cub Sox games at Wrigley Field. And probably one of the more memorable ones was that uh, I worked for the Wrigley company and I won four box seats in a silent auction that the company held for the Sunday night game of the week, uh, Cubs versus Sox. And it was like third row behind the on deck circle. And there were White Sox fans in the crowd that were using profanity. I mean, and it was intense to the point where some of them were getting thrown out. Um, And so that uh, some of the fans, some of the fans just don't understand this is entertainment. (laughs) This is not life for Christ's sake. And, um, but the games, the games were intense. And then the fan and stands, the cheering was intense. There was constant booing and profanity going on. I never yeah, went to I, another Cub Sox game on a Sunday night again. I, I've been to a Cub Sox game at Wrigley on a Sunday night. I, I've been to Cub Sox games at, 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 we'll call it Comiskey Park, just because there's so many different names of it now. Oh. Um, and it's, it, it was scary. I, I, I was wearing, you know, Cubs shirts and whatever. And uh, I had a guy, I was sitting in my seat with my wife next to me and a guy's walking up the aisle and he spout something at me. I'm just like looking at him and I, I forget what he said, but it was a, uh, it wasn't nice. And he just kept walking by me up the aisle. And then I remember being in the upper deck, I'll never forget this. Um, this is before they changed the upper deck at Comiskey Park. They used to have even more seats up there and it felt even worse than it does now where it was. Uh, he froze. I think Jeff lost his internet. Did I? I'm right here. Oh, okay. Oh, there he is. Oh. Are we good? Okay. Yeah, we're getting red um, bars on you. All right, let me see if I can uh, just go somewhere else. I'm getting seasick. I'm going to walk you through my house a little bit. So we were in the upper deck, and Carlos Lee hit the sacrifice fly to win the game. And uh, I had a guy just about accost me. Because, because I was wearing the wrong uh, the wrong shirt, so that was uh, let me get some light. That was a scary moment. But they're still fun games, and um, uh, I need more light. Hang on. How, how did the city feel about Ernie Banks? I mean, he was the uh, the star all those years. Ernie Banks is revered. Yeah. Ernie Banks is Mr. Cub and he will, there will never be another Mr. Cub. He is revered. There's a statue of him outside of Wrigley Field. Um, And, uh, you know, there's been a, since he died, there's been a a wonderful book about him by Ron Rappaport, a former sometimes uh, sports columnist that's out and, and got rave reviews. There was a great documentary on the Cubs new television network. Um, the Marquee Sports Network about Ernie Banks. And he, you know, what's amazing about that 1969 team is uh, it didn't win anything, yet it has Hall of Famers. You know, half of that lineup is in the Hall of Fame, it seems, with, with Ernie Banks and Billy Williams and Ron Santo. Uh, that team might, might be the most, aside from the 2016 World Series team, the, the Cubs have won division titles in between, uh, several, yet uh, that 69 team might be the second most revered team in Cubs history because of just the personalities they had, the the, the, the change in, in, in tone of that franchise for that season 
was just a, it was a, it was a, 69 it was a summer it was a wonderful summer at Wrigley and I think um and still to this day that team is just is just beloved and Ernie Banks is yeah, one of the reasons thank you as a Mets fan 69 yeah. is a beloved year as you might imagine yeah well what's funny is <laughs> um growing up that's all you heard as a Cubs fan was about 69 and I didn't, you know, growing up, I didn't know the Mets from the Yankees, but uh -huh. you knew about 69. And so you were just, you were just raised to hate the Mets. <laughs> and, and what was great was my first real, you know, I, I started watching the Cubs, I'd say in 82, but in 84, when I was really into it, they were battling the Mets. So it almost right. worked out perfectly where here was a team that I was <laughs> told to hate was the Cubs main rival in 84 for the NL East division. So then I did have a, my own reason to hate the Mets because they were fighting for that, for that same title. Um, so yeah, I, I know all about the uh, 69 season because you're, you're taught it growing up, right. you know, you didn't right. live it, but you you were taught about what happened. Then after 84, we hated so, Steve Garvey. <laughs> uh, yes. Right. He was, I still do to this day. Although, from what I understand, and I and being in the business, um, I'm told he's a great guy. So when you hear stuff like that, it kind of tempers you. But um, no, he's still the villain. I still watch the '84 season, however I can. Um, I, I have a, a a YouTube channel with old games, Chicago games from my VHS collection. I used to tape games all the time. I'd go to a game and record it in case something were to happen. I wanted to come home and see it. So I have this YouTube channel of all these old Chicago games, Cubs, Sox, Bulls, Hawks, um, Illinois, uh, from when we were only on VCRs. And I put them on um, my computer and um, uploaded them to YouTube. And, I, and lately I've been getting CDs from people who have a collection of their own or for people in the TV industry. And I just got this past week from WGN. They were nice enough to give me it's a, a half hour, an hour long show on the 84 Cubs. Uh, uh, Milo Hamilton narrates it. And I'm going to post it uh, soon for people to see because it's just, it's a wonderful trip down memory lane right, to yeah. see that kind of stuff. Jeff, what, yeah, do, you, Jeff, what do you Jeff, uh, what do you think is the... Uh, uh, commitment of the Ricketts family toward the toward the Cubs. Are they in this for the long haul, or, or are they looking to sell out? Or yeah, that's that's that had never really come into question until uh, the last year or two with the way things have been going. Now they they're, they're saying you know a lot of it is pandemic related, and that very well may be true, but just the inaction of the front office in seemingly trying to compete. Now, they're looking more toward the future and I understand there's a time where you have to cut bait on some of your stars who are not working out, but it seems as though they hung on to their stars and hindsight's it's always 2020, but it seems as though they've hung on to their stars or at least misjudged their stars um, for too long because now you've had Chris Bryant come out and say he has not enjoyed playing the game because of all the trade rumors that have been circulating about him the last couple of years. Kyle Schwarber's gone. Um, you Darvish, who you got after the World Series team, is gone. And the signal it sends is not a good one when you're trading your ace for players who aren't even in the minor leagues yet. They are years away from making an, a, an impact on your franchise. And that's hard to watch. Now, what's fortunate for them is the club can still be competitive in that division. It is a bad division. But as far as the Ricketts commitment goes, I, I'd have a hard time believing that they're going to sell anytime soon because they just started the network. They have finished the renovations of the ballpark and of the surrounding area. So if there's no pandemic, they should, they should have a, you know, a, this, should, this should be the roaring 20s hundred years later for the Cubs because of all this revenue that has been coming in from revenue streams, television, concessions, merchandising, the hotel, all of this stuff. But because of the pandemic, that's not going to happen so soon. So my hope would be that they, 
I've appreciated their ownership because of what they've done for the ballpark. That place was in bad shape and they've saved it. The White Sox were not able to do that with Comiskey Park in the 80s and into the 90s. They had to get rid of it because it was just not taken care of. The Ricketts have saved Wrigley Field, basically. And I think that's a huge feather in their cap. They did win a World Series that is kind of being forgotten because of what's been going on lately with this team and how they haven't done a whole lot the last couple of years. But I, I think they are still in this because the revenue that they were hoping to get from their projects will eventually come. It's just going to be a few years later, I think, than they originally hoped, you know, pre-pandemic. So, yeah, I, I think they're still in this thing, but um, it's been hard to watch lately, you know. And I think some people also have been turned off by their their politics. Uh, not all of them. Not all of them. You know, they're, they're, within the family, there's different politics. But since everything has become political, I think some people have been turned off by that. I've, I don't, I set that aside. That's, that's a different ball game, literally. And I just focus on the baseball side of what they're trying to do. And I think they're still in this thing for a while. Yes, I do. Hmm. But how about the Mets? We have, I know we have Mets fans in the audience. Yeah. Uh, Steve Cohn, God bless him. He's, uh, he's having a lot of fun with that, with that, with that franchise, um, bringing them back to life. My goodness. That's sure. He's, Hey, on a, Jewish, uh, on a Jewish note, in 1968, yeah. I went to a Cubs game where the two starting pitchers were Jewish. Any idea who they were? Anybody? Kenny Holtzman being one. That's right. Who was the other? Sandy, Sandy Koufax the other. That's right. Like... Kenny Holtzman and Sandy Koufax. Yeah. And Kenny Holtzman won. There were many hits in that game, but it was a great game and a great memory. Both lefties. Yeah. yeah, they. Uh, yeah. Anybody know what Kenny Holtzman's doing these days? No, no, I don't. He just sort um, of disappeared. Hey, one of the he had an accounting of, business or something like that. What is it? I think he had an accounting business. He was uh, a business uh, guy. I mean, he sense. actually earned a degree um, and was able to, um, you know, post career have have a living, having another career. Ah, his, his post career was what Jewish guys do, counting. <laughs> well, there's still several in the game now. You know, I think isn't Gabe Kapler, uh, the Giants manager? He's Jewish. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was a big fan of uh, the Israeli World Baseball Classic team several years ago that went to the um, that advanced in that tournament. They were a lot of fun to watch. They were playing overnight in in Tokyo. <laughs> But I was following them. Um, they were very good. Uh, Josh Zide, the pitcher, is with the Cubs organization now. At least he was recently in their um, sort of pitching analytics department in, in Arizona. Um, Cody Decker on that team has been on the radio. He's, he's been a guest host on The Score in Chicago, sports radio here. He was, uh, he was a good ball player. Um, Jason Marquis pitched on that team, the former Cubs, the former right. Cardinal. Um, you know, I remember Sean Green of the Dodgers, uh, right fielder, very good. He had a record for a while. I think it was most bases in a game. Yeah. Uh, when he had like three or four home runs in a game. I got a photograph on my website that I sell that lists all the Jewish ball players uh, up to about uh, 2014, 2015. Then I just stopped updating the photo. It's just too much work. One of my favorites was Craig Breslau, the left-handed relief specialist. He's in the Cubs front office now. I had the pleasure of meeting him and his parents. And he's from Connecticut. Oh. So I met him at a fundraiser at a Jewish temple in Connecticut. And, and his folks, who were wonderful people as well. Great guy. Wonderful. Um, Brad Osmus. Yeah. Former manager, he 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 had a part on the uh, in in the Israeli baseball uh, uh, team. He's from the town right next to mine. He's from Cheshire, Connecticut. Oh, proud is. Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah I'm I'm from Philly, and Sam Full just guy became the uh, general Fold. manager. Right, right. Fold used to play with the Cubs. Yeah, in the outfield. Right, right. Out uh, in the Rays. Um. I was thinking, well, Ryan Braun. Yeah, oh, of course. Um, and Mo Berg. 
Paul Burke. Sure. <laughs> we could go back. We can go to Hank Greenberg. Yeah, yeah. If you want to go back to them. Uh, yeah. them. Eucalyst, Eucalyst played for, uh, didn't he play for the Cubs one year? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the White Sox, too. Right. Was he on the Cubs? He definitely the White Sox. He was, he was good for the White Sox. And the Red Sox. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yeah, he was the on the Red Sox and the White Sox. Yeah, they. Yeah, I'm uh, not sure if it's everywhere, but the Jewish Film Festival, I'm down here in Florida, is having this story of Mo Berg as one of their films. Uh, mm. Yeah, you know what? There was a film on that Israeli baseball team, on, on the Team yeah. Israel. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, video. That was really good. It was. That was. It was. Yeah, there was yeah. a Mets player on that one, too. Uh, oh, my gosh. The first base. Art Shamsky. Yeah, Art Shamsky. No, on the uh, Team Israel. Had oh, on a, Team Israel. Uh, had a recent Met. And oh, I can well. picture him, and I, I'm, I'm going to get that name, though. I'm going to find that name. What position did he play? I believe it was first base. I'm going to look it up now. Uh, bear with me here. Oh, yeah, his dad played for the pitch for the Yankees. Yeah, I think he had some, uh, he, he did have lineage. Ike Davis. Ike. Oh, Ike, Ike Davis. Ike. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, I remember the yeah. first designated hitter was a Jewish guy. I can't remember his name. Oh, Ron Lumberg, Lumberg right? Yeah, yeah. Ron don't we all said Nachas? I always look up. It always bothered my son. I always wanted to see if somebody was Jewish, and when they were, I was so excited. <laughs> Same here. It's, it's our generation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. I, uh, I know what you mean. I. Um, it's funny. Um, now, I know we're not getting. I'm sorry, we're not getting on this, but uh, Biden's cabinet is full of Jews. Yes, three or four. So I know you don't want to discuss that. But Attorney well, no. General, uh, I mean, he's entire Secretary of State, Treasurer. So, he, you know. That's wonderful. It's wonderful. Um, if things work out. <laughs> right. Yeah, I suppose you're right. <laughs> if they don't, they'll be coming for us. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah. Well, what's, what's new? You know, it's interesting. You were talking, Jeff, previously about Hank Aaron. He was signed uh, by the Boston Braves, and uh, their offer for signing him was $50 more than the New York Giants per month. Uh, can you imagine if he was in the same outfield with Willie Mays? Yeah, I saw that article. That there was a chance of that happening. Oh, my gosh. That <laughs> been, uh, I mean, that would have been crazy just to have – you know, to see all these pictures – I love the history of games and to see these pictures of, of, of Henry Aaron in the different uniforms in, in Milwaukee and in Atlanta. I saw one I had never seen of, uh, it was of, of, of Henry in, um, in a Braves uniform with, with pinstripes. And I had never seen the Braves wear pinstripes, hmm. either in Milwaukee or Atlanta. So I, I, I have to go back and see if I can find that picture again. I think I saw it on a Facebook um, I mean, I'm big into uniforms and the history of uniforms. I love unis. And uh, there's a Facebook group I'm in that shows old pictures and stuff. And it was, it was Henry Aaron in a Braves jersey that I had never, I never seen before. So Guess where Aaron hit most of his home runs? Was Milwaukee? No, he hit him at Wrigley. Oh, at Wrigley. <laughs> <laughs> he hit two off of Fergie Jenkins. <laughs> You know, like like Mike Schmidt, they all seem to like to come to Wrigley and play back yeah. the ball around. Schmidt was a cub killer. When the wind was blowing in the right direction. There's a, a there's a fantastic book I read. I caught up, caught up. I, I did a lot of reading um, this past year with the pandemic and all on just just baseball books. Uh, do I have it here? It's it's a book solely on the 23 to 22 Cubs Phillies game in 79 it starts it begins with the histories of the franchises the history of that season to the date of that game and then the most of the book is on that game hmm. and ending a chapter and then it goes post what happened to those teams after that game like donnie moore was was a cub on that team and uh it goes into his horrific finish to his life um 
uh, Bob Boone on the Phillies. It goes oh. into his, uh, oh. how he joined, how he became a union, a baseball union man. And uh, just a fantastic, fantastic book. And then just to go into that game itself, I mean, that was, that game became a book and it was a great book. And um, I've got it here somewhere. You might disagree, but I think the outcome of the game was perfect. 23-22? Yeah, because I'm from Philly. Oh, there you go. Well, here, this is uh, oh. Hannings at Wrigley How about by that? Kevin Cook. Uh -huh. And it's, I mean, it's really off, off of one game. He's got 250 pages here. Mm. Um, I mean, uh, it was before and after, too, but just, it was just fantastic. I was, I was blown away by um, the detail that he had, you know, by the pitch um, mm. for that game. They didn't have lights. Yeah, the Cubs in the fifth. Jeff, did they have lights at that time or no? No, 88 no. was lights. Yeah. Um, with, with, with the Phillies. They were in the, they were in the first game uh, with, well, it wasn't, it, actually, no, they weren't. The Mets were in the first game with lights because the game against the Phillies never happened. Yeah, there um, you go. I like saying that because I went to the game against the Mets. Uh -huh. uh, on Tuesday, uh, I remember watching with a friend uh, the game Monday night when it was raining. We were praying they would call the game. We were we were praying that they would that the rain would just continue and they'd call the game and then we'd get to say that we went to the first night game. We had seats in the right field bleachers uh -huh. behind Andre Dawson and Daryl Strawberry. Uh -huh. and it was just mm -hmm. it was a just a chaotic scene. It was awesome. But um, so when they called the game, we were jubilant we were dancing around the basement because we knew we were going to be at the first night game so and that was the game um, <laughs> Dykstra got stumped on with beer in center field uh, in the pivotal inning and the Cubs won um, I think it was six to four mm. uh, it was a great game uh, the game was on NBC nationally on a Tuesday night which was unheard of at the time because we just didn't do that but for the for a night game at Wrigley they uh, which was the first one they they do. They'll sometimes show that on, on the marquee network. Um, but um, hmm. I I'm, I have a ticket stub, and it was a really cheap leecher seat at the time, and that was um, that was very special. The Cubs and the Mets being the Mets being the opponent of that game was was very cool too. The Cub fans didn't like Daryl Strawberry. He, he sat out in the bleachers. No. They'd be yelling at him all the time. Hmm. Yeah, we they chanted Daryl, Daryl. That's mean, right. Over and over. And, and then they ended with a the derogatory play. statement. <laughs> yeah. Help me if I if I have this right, but I think years ago Memorial Day, the cities that had two teams often played each other. In other words, in Philadelphia. So I went out for a wedding on a Memorial Day, and we went out to Wrigley Field to see the Cubs and the White Sox. And I didn't know Chicago. I froze my tuchus off on <laughs> Memorial Day. Oh my! Said, you, how do you live out here? Oh. <laughs> well, it's not it's not like Buffalo or, or Cleveland, but it uh, on Memorial Day. Wow, that must have been an odd. Usually by Memorial yeah. Day, you're you're okay. I've, I've had we've had some hot Memorial Days and some rainy Memorial Days. Like, I'm trying to remember a cold Memorial Day. May is still a cold month. Um, the Ivy doesn't really turn until Memorial Day. Um, but that's interesting. Cubs, Sox, and Memorial. They used to play an exhibition game once a year. Right. And it turned us just to, you know, with a bunch of prospects. But that was really the a Cubs Sox game was uh, what Jordan played in. Michael Jordan played in in uh, in '94. I think it was '94 uh, when Harry Carey got to interview him before the game, and then he Jordan like doubled on the left field line. But you know they would never dream of playing a Cubs Sox exhibition game anymore in the middle of a season. I uh, just they wouldn't. That, that's that's not a money winner. They, they count, but at the time there was no interleague play yet. So once a year they would play the Cubs and the Sox um, in an exhibition that amounted to a, a spring training game because nobody really of relevance played for more than a couple of innings, if at all. So that's that's interesting that they would that they would have that. Um, but it's football day. It's still a football day. Does anybody have a pick for who's going to be in the Super Bowl after today? Go go anyway. Mm -hmm. No football fans out there? No one's going to be watching Green, the game? Green Bay. I'm sorry? Green Bay. Yeah, Green yeah, Bay. I think, I think so, too. Green Bay. Who are they going to play against, Shelly? Green Bay versus who in the Super Bowl? I don't know. If Mahomes performs today after this concussion protocol, I think could be 
uh, KC. Yeah, I'm I'm hoping it's that. I hope it's that'd be that'd be fun. We'd see a lot of highlights of Super Bowl one. Um, yeah. In a half empty Memorial Coliseum in LA Memorial Coliseum because it hasn't really caught on yet. Uh, <laughs> and I, price, I, the ticket prices were certainly reasonable. Yeah. And, and I think I think it was on two networks too. Yeah. I think yeah. two television stations carried the game because it was like an exhibition almost. It was it was not uh, not a big deal. It's hard to believe fifty five years later if they would play in the same one. That would be That'd be really cool. This uh, might be hard to believe, but Vince Lombardi is going to be sending down direct some suggestions to the Green Bay coach. I wouldn't doubt it. It's divine <laughs> intervention, you know, uh, that, that tends to happen in these kinds of games. But yeah, I, I, I hope it does. I have a neighbor across the street who puts on his Packers flag. Let me see if it's out here. Right? No, it's not yet, but it will be. We each hang our flags. I put my Bears flag out on some of the Packers <laughs> flag out across the street. And um, when they play each other, we don't talk to each other uh, until <laughs> afterward. But it's um, it's fun. It's fun. Actually, I, w- I was thinking back because it's been it was uh, ten years ago when the Bears and Packers met in the NFC Championship game, and that was uh, that was a cold day. Talk about I mean that was a cold snow blowing day, and that was that was ugly because I remember my kids were in elementary school at the time. And there was talk of some bullying going on in school between Bears and Packers fans. There's a lot of Packers fans in the area. And these were like, let's see, if I was 2010, my son was at the time six or seven. uh, And six and seven year olds were having to be warned to knock it off. They'd come (laughs) to school in their Bears and Packers jerseys and they were giving it to each other. And, uh, we couldn't believe it. <laughs> Sounds like our men's club. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of diehard Packer fans that are involved. Uh, one's going to be a co-president of the men's club. And then even the synagogue president currently, she's from, she's a big time Green Bay Packer fan. Well, it, it's got to be civil. I, me and my neighbor are civil. Our children are civil. They, they play together and they wear their jerseys. And it's fun, but in school something happened with some kids, and it didn't seem fun. So that's uh, that was that was too bad to hear. But that was gosh, that was ten years ago, and and the Bears haven't uh, done a whole lot. Uh, the, whole war, lot the, the war, the world, the war of the words goes on in Facebook. <laughs> right. Yes. Exactly. Twitter for, for the kids now. Instagram, really. Um, but I know that in New York, the Jets have a new coach and the Giants are on the upswing so football might be back uh in the Big Apple soon you know where you had you went from having the you had team two teams with top five draft picks to the future being brighter um and in Philadelphia they have a new coach so that's exciting for them they can figure out which quarterback they want to keep who's their coach um Guy from Indianapolis. I just uh, if you, I can't pronounce the name. Sianni or Sianni? Nick, Nick or Sirianni. Sirianni. Nick, Nick Sirianni was the Colts offensive coordinator for the last three years under Frank Reich, <clears throat> and now he is the Eagles head coach. Um, so we'll see. I don't know much about him. We're Maybe getting a lot of new new Bowles. blood. I'm sorry. Maybe we could give him Nick Foles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I tell you what, there was talk the Phil Phillies fans the Philly fans wanted him back because he got off such a good start with the Bears. Yeah. And they were having problems with Wentz. But uh, then we saw the real Nick Foles, I think, and um that was that was the end of that. Yeah, it's he's, very in, he's very inconsistent. Yeah, yeah. There'll be a, there'll be a lot of quarterback changes this next this coming off season. We saw last night Matthew Stafford's gonna be traded from the Lions. You know, hmm. Bears might have a new quarterback. The Eagles, the Sean Watson with the Texans, he's vowing never to come back to Houston. Um, you know, uh, the Dolphins, but are, are they going to keep Tua at quarterback? There's a uh, Philip Rivers is retiring, so who's the Colts quarterback going to be? Um, there's always Mike Glennon. There's always Mike, there's always Mike Glennon. Right, <laughs> right. Nobody wants. We'll bring back wants Sammy Law. He's Sid in Jacksonville Luckman. somehow. Maybe Sid Luckman will come back. Right, there we go. Right, there you go. 
Johnny Luchak. Yeah, Luckman. We'll root for Luckman. <laughs> He's one of us. Yeah. Right. Um, there's a a Chiefs offensive lineman, I think, Schwartz, who's I think of. I'd have to look it up, but uh, I think he's. I don't have their roster in front of me here, but I think he's here. Maybe I have it here. I th- there are some Jews playing football. Yeah, there aren't many, but um, I think the Chiefs have one. No, I don't. There's, a, there's a lineman I keep reading. I think it might be the Schwartz, who's really, good, really good. But I can't. Yeah, I thought his last name was Schwartz, but I don't see him. Maybe he used to play for them. But anyway, I'll be on the couch starting at two o'clock uh, <laughs> with, with kickoff of um, of Packers Bucks. I work tonight, so I'll have the second game on my my iPad as I'm working at the dining room table. That's how we're putting out the paper these days. It's from home remotely. Wow. Wow. Um, having the pages sent to the printing press, um, it's an amazing feat that it, that we get this done. But we the paper's out every night remotely. Perfect. Just, uh, just that's amazing. Been, has that been since March? Yes, I have not been in the office since the middle of March. I think March 13th was uh, our last day there. Maybe even the 11th. Uh, I'm sorry, the 12th. I think we were home the 13th of Friday. Because I got the the uh, the email alert from our from the news department that the governor was going to shut stuff down. I remember yeah. calling my wife at work and being like, "I'm running over to Jewel right now because we're not leaving the house for a little while here." Um, crazy times. I don't know if anybody listens to podcasts, but um, ESPN, the Thirty for Thirty franchise, they do audio podcasts, and they have they came out with one about March 11th. 2020 when sports shut down and I'm in the middle of listening to it now it's just one hour but it's a, it's a fascinating look back it feels like forever ago but um, they go into great detail in audio of how that day went down from the beginning of the day to the end of the day with the NBA closing shop just um, amazing what went on that day uh, Rich, uh, Dr. Fauci is on there talking about it his meetings with Trump that day and his advisors and how all that went down and just that's, that's an amazing day in history, um, mm-hmm. if you're interested in looking back. Um, but thank you all for joining me. And this has been a lot of fun. Norwin, thank, yeah, you, thank, for, you, thank you for organizing this. Uh, hopefully we can do it again sometime in the future. Absolutely. Always Absolutely. In. Thank you all for, for sharing your thoughts and your passion for sports. I love it. And um, I'm, I'm impressed by your knowledge of sports. I really am, Jeff. Oh, thanks. It's, <laughs> there's more knowledgeable than me, I know. But um, I appreciate that. Thank you. You're the one. It's a pleasure talking with you, and, and you're all, all your all of your knowledge too, and, and your memories. Thank you so for Jeff, sharing. Are we going to appear in your column tonight? <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it appears Fridays, <laughs> Thursday afternoons online. Um, we'll see what we can do. Maybe I can put some hidden hidden messages in there somehow. <laughs> thanks, thanks to Chicago. Chicago thanks thanks for everyone for joining us. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Enjoyed, care, it. Well. Enjoyed it with Take you care. guys. Thank you very much. Take care, Thank New York all. brothers. Right on.